Welcome back <clears throat> to another classic L5R deck tech here on the Colad Information Network. Um, you'll notice this is a dragon box, but it does not contain a dragon deck, as you saw from the intro. This is the deck. that got me into playing Legend of the Five Rings. <clears throat> so the conversation went like this. Um, the store I was playing at our uh, TO had just came back from Gen Con back in those days it was still in Milwaukee and um, I looked over at the um, some of the games I was a magic player and uh, we played Pokemon as well because my sister was six years younger so we both played that game. Um, and um, I mentioned that the game looked pretty neat. And I know he went to Gen Con, so I asked him, I was like, what, what won Worlds? And he said, Monks. And I said, Enlightenment? And he said, Military. I said, you have me intrigued? He said, um, uh, what starters do you want? <laughs> the rest was history. Um, you could call them Kung Fu monks, you could call them uh, water monks, but this was the stronghold that got me interested in the game. The, um, the House of Tao. At the time it was a Brotherhood Stronghold. Of course, later on, we know it as a Dragon Stronghold uh, after um, in Diamond. So this Stronghold has a 5 Province Strength, 3 Gold Production, and uh, 4 Starting Honor. You begin the game with 1 Elemental Ring in play. chosen after your opponent's stronghold has been revealed. If you ever put a Shadowlands card into play then all your rings are removed from the game. So you can't play anything corrupt. Um, so the, the deck started, the deck only runs three rings. Um, it runs Void because you want a way to refill your hand. Um, or and but which, which ring you start with is dependent upon what you're playing against. You are a military deck. This version was a military deck. Um, Brett Swanson, I believe, was the pilot that won the world championship that year. I believe the year was 1999. Um, so the military build of the deck started the Ring of Water against every faction except Unicorn and against Unicorn it played the Ring of Earth. Um, so the Ring of Water um, so I'll read how to play them because that's not inconsequential most times. Uh, play this card after in any battle after which you destroy the terrain, play the terrain, and then destroy either an opposing army or province, either as the attacker or defender. Uh, on your turn, you can assign infantry and cavalry after defending infantry and cavalry has assigned. So back in that day, before we had the cavalry. Um, change to a cavalry got an action to move in etc um, 
when you declared an attack, um, you declared attacking infantry, then your as the attacker, the defender, then chooses uh, def defending infantry. Then it goes back to the attacker who attack who declares um, attacking cavalry, and then the defender chooses defending cavalry. Uh, what the Ring of Water does is the defender has to choose their uh, their personalities and their locations before you declare where the attackers are going um, in each phase. So it would go defender, infantry, attacker, infantry, uh, defender, cavalry, attacking cavalry. So the Ring of Water was not very was not great against Unicorn because you couldn't dance around them. Um, but against every other clan or mostly every other clan um, they might have had one personality who was cavalry and everybody else was infantry so basically they have to defend with first and then you get to go where they're not and that's why they're called water monks so the earth ring is play this card after an attack against one of your provinces in which the attacking army had force greater than your province strength at any point but the battle was not destroyed while this card is in play, all of your provinces has plus three strength. Um, so you played this against unicorns so they couldn't blitz you, uh, giving you more time. Um, but for the most part, you would start water. Um, you are running the Kaede Sensei. Um, Buy your stronghold, get any one elemental ring from your deck or discard pile and put it into your hand. You cannot achieve an honor victory this game. All the decks that were playing this didn't care about um, an honor victory anyway. Um, they cared about getting their rings. Alright, so I'm going to set those aside. <clears throat> I ended up choosing orchid sleeves because, I mean... The only color I could find that was uh, that had anything to do with um, you know Buddhist monks, lotus, etc. Uh, so we're going to start with blessings of Asawa. Uh, the next kiho uh, that you perform is is permanently attached to a personality. Uh, they cannot cast the um, or use the ability more than once per turn. Um, again, there's a few keyhoes um, in here that are nice and reusable. Um, and so, um, ha getting to staple one on your personality, particularly force bonus, is uh, very good. Um, the version uh, that Brett ran at Worlds, ran Corruption of the Harmonies because Shugenja based decks were quite good, particularly Phoenix and this did a real number on them. Uh, all Shugenjas in play are bout. Uh, Colette Duplicate you get to target a personality in play. Um, all cards in the personality unit are shuffled back into their owner's decks. All versions of the personality have their gold cost reduced to zero for the rest of the game. Um, but honor is not gained when you brought them into, bring them into play. Um, again. Again, this gets rid of key personality. Occult murders. Um, each player chooses a personality or region controlled by their opponent. It says each player on the right, but we're not playing multiplayer. Um, all selected personality or retainers are destroyed. Uh, Imperial Gift. Gain to honor. Search your fate deck for one item. Uh, reveal it, put it in your hand, and shuffle your fate deck. 
Um, there's a there's a couple of very powerful items in the deck um, that are very very good uh, for this ma for the matchups. So um, this is very important to search those out. And then inheritance. Um, Inheritance uh, produces five gold uh, to bring a sing single card into play. Uh, then inheritance is destroyed, or it's destroyed at the end of the turn if it's not used. Um, so you got five gold for one card, basically. Um, Golden Sun Plain, unique region, once per turn, uh, increase the uh, production of one of your gold producing holdings by two when it bows to produce gold. Um, just really good to to help your uh, smooth your gold out. Now your holdings. Uh, you're running three merchant caravan. So you bow and discard a fake card to produce gold equal to the focus value. Um, it's zero gold so it's cheap and effective. Uh, three copies of small farm um, zero gold bows to produce one three copies of large farm uh, one gold bows to produce two gold and the last holding is prayer shrines it's two gold bows to produce two gold uh, or if you're um, a brotherhood the Shinsei player uh, it produces one additional gold for each elemental ring you have in play so under the house of, of Tao uh, with a starting ring in play it bows to produce three but you can actually it can actually produce more um, this is one of the big advantages of being a mug player if you were playing the enlightenment side of the deck you could have this produce four or even five gold All right, personalities. Three copies of Shiota, one force, four chi, uh, zero honor requirement, zero gold, and two personal honor. Online monk. Uh, you must control at least one elemental print, elemental ring, to bring Shiota into play. And it has the ability, uh, the, the ability open. Bow Shiota and a temple you control to straighten your stronghold. Now, the, for this particular deck, the ability is is nominal. You're basically using this as a free um, a free one four that per, that proclaims for two, um, and that freeness is going to be important. Next up is three copies of E. Cuda. Two force, two chi, dash, three, one, unaligned monk. So basically a, a blank, cheap monk uh, for one gold because you're not proclaiming him in this deck. Um, quick, easy, not painful. Uh, this is the only personality out of clan. Um, three copies of Hasame, uh, two force, two chi, dash three one, unaligned samurai to Turi's army. Uh, well, not attach non-human followers. Um, so, this is just another cheap personality for the deck. He, he has absolutely no synergy other than that. Uh, Hoshi Masaru, uh, two two zero five two unaligned monk tattooed. Reaction: Straighten Masaru immediately after he bows to perform a kiho. This may be done once per turn. So straightening him um, is 
after playing a keyhole is quite Im important. Because um, basically, all, all keyhoes at this time in the in the game bowed, with the exception of a few if they targeted the same the targeted yourself. Uh, so basically, getting a a free action without bowing him was actually quite useful. Uh, Komaru, two force, three chi, uh, zero five two, on a line monk. All meditation cards and meditating at a shrine provide an additional plus one force plus two chi bonus uh, to Komaru for the same du du duration as the meditation card. So meditation is a is a fate card um, that gives um, a force and chi bonus. You'll see that here shortly. He basically doubles the bonus if he targets him. Uh, Carrazzo, two force, two chi, or three chi, uh, three honor requirement, five gold, cost two personal honor, unaligned monk. Battle. Carrazzo gains plus one force, plus one chi until end of turn if there are one or more tattooed personalities in his army. Can be performed once per battle. Uh, so obviously, Uh, <clears throat> there aren't that many tattooed personalities in this particular deck except for the Hoshi Masaru and another personality we'll get to here in a minute uh, but making yourself a 3-4 for four, what essentially is 3 gold uh, is quite good again more about getting the force in uh, now we talk get to one of the powerhouses Yoshun Four Force, One Chi, Zero Five Two, Unaligned Monk, Keeper of the Four Temples. Yoshun's Chi cannot be raised except through focusing. So basically, he, can, he can't get any Chi bonuses. Um, uh, but he can get Force bonuses. Four Force for three gold was really good even in those days. Um, our last two cards are both uniques. This is Hoshi Masaru, um, one force, one sheave, zero five two, unaligned monk, tattooed, experienced, unique. Uh, has a force, uh, has a plus one force, plus one chi bonus for each elemental ring you have in play. So he starts at least as a two two, and if you end up playing any of the other rings, he gets bigger. Reaction: Bow Masaru when a card is used for focus value. The focus value of that card is increased by the number of elemental rings you have in play. So the second ability is not uh, its not much. Um, that is particularly more useful in the Enlightenment version of the deck. Um, but he can still get bigger if you happen to play the other rings. <laughs> Again, just another cheap body. And the last body is um, the experienced version of Ikudia. Uh, so this version is a 33-61 unaligned monk colot experienced unique battle. Once per turn, move into this battle a number of your unbowed monk personalities up to the number of elemental rings you have in play. So again, more movement tricks. Um, also, this was my first experience with reading the word colot on a card and got me interested. Okay. Dynasty deck complete. Let's go to the fate deck. Alright, so we already know about the Ring of the Void. I'm going to set it out. Um, 
So we're going to start with one Koku. So this card is zero gold. Reaction, play when you're paying a gold cost to produce one gold. So this was a card from Crimson and Jade. You could also trade this in to the Imperial Assembly and it counted as one Koku for other cards. Um, I'm surprised I even found a place set in all these these cards. Most of the ones that I have are from Emperor Edition. Um, but these help smooth out your gold cost for the deck and let you play multiple cards in turns where you normally would not be able to. A test of courage. Zero gold cost. Uh, when one of your personalities has been targeted by an action that will remove them from the battle, play this card to cancel the action. Uh, you, may, you may not bow this personality to produce actions or target the personality with actions for the remainder of the turn. Uh, again, this is to keep your people in battles. Um, Uh, particularly if they're trying to slow your um, water monk rush down, um, this is a good way to stop that. Next up is a interesting uh, control card. Deeds, not words. Zero cost political open. Target a player. Until the end of the turn, that player gains one additional honor. Um, when one of his personalities wins a duel and one additional honor for each opposing card destroyed in the resolution segment. Honor gains from all other sources are counted as losses instead of gains for that player. So what did this card do? Uh, it stopped your opponent from playing actions that weren't duels to gain the honor it stopped them from pro proclaiming personalities as they entered play. Um, it stopped uh, them from bowing um, holdings to gain honor. Um, so this was a, basically an honor card. Um, but it also had some unique uh, properties in the mirror. Back in those days, if you could proclaim a personality, I think you couldn't, so like Shioda particularly, you couldn't, um, you couldn't reduce his cost because his cost was zero, so you had to proclaim him, which meant if you brought him into play, if you played this, they could not bring the Shiotas in play without taking uh, an honor loss of two, um, which could be quite devastating since you start at four honor, and that's actually going to bring you below on some of the cards you have to, that you have to play. Uh, so it was actually a neat countermeasure as well. So next up we have Charge. Um, no, uh, this gives a battle action. It either gives plus three force if you're a lion or plus two force if you're not. Obviously we're nowhere near lions, so uh, but we'll take our plus two. Uh, three copies of Meditation. Uh, target personality gets plus one force plus two chi until the end of turn. Um, so for that against that one monk personality he gets plus two plus four instead of plus one plus two um, three copies uh, refugees um, target personality with no, uh, no followers attached send the personality home they can pay one gold to attach a one force uh, a sugar follower to the personality and this made uh, this action can be done if in a battle where you have no units um, this really uh, can slow down counterattacks since followers were not played very much back in those days this one is actually one of those decks that actually did play followers so it's a little uh, little different but uh, yeah that was actually a good countermeasure uh, rallying cries play immediately before the battle resolution segment all your units uh, don't bow when they go home that was a very powerful effect
in those days made counterattacking very difficult. All right, more pumps. Uh, Destiny has no secrets. Reveal your hand to all other players and give one of your personalities plus two force plus two chi until end of turn. Uh, again, this is just another pump effect for the deck. Now to the key hose. Uh, banish all shadows. Um, limited key hose. Bow one of your shugenja or monks. Look at the top four cards of your fade deck. Take one of those cards and put it into your hand. Shuffle the other three into your deck. Um, so basically let you dig a little bit more. Uh, you, in the Enlightenment version of this deck, you ran three copies of this card because it was mwah, it's amazing. All right, this is probably your best force pump in this deck. Chasing Osano Wo. Zero gold cost Kiho battle. Bow one of your monk or shugenjas to give a force bonus to any personality equal to the force of your monk or shugenja plus the personal honor of the target. So, bowing a Shioda gives plus three fours. Um, bowing a <laughs> bowing a Yoshin um, gives um, plus four fours plus a personal honor of the target. So. This was a this was an important key hose. This was the one that you typically wanted to, it, to attach with blessings of Asawa. Um, the wind's truth. Uh, again, this is for the honor matchup. Um, buy one of your monkish genjas when honor is being gained or lost. Redirect the gain or loss to another player. Now the followers. I don't know if I did a deep dive on followers. Um, yep. Um, so followers. Um, Ashigaru um, has a variable force. No chi. Zero honor requirement. Zero gold cost. Uh, Ashigaru has plus one force for each of your small farms in play. Um, this was a ladder change to each of your farms instead of just small farms. Um, you're running six farms in the deck, three small and three large. Uh, so this could be up to a six force. If Ashigaru is destroyed, lose two honor. So let's talk about honor requirement. The personality that you play the follower onto back in these days um, your personality had to have at least zero personal honor what was in the fan for this to attach if it doesn't if it didn't have then you could not attach the follower to the personality this was quite annoying um, particularly when you're playing against a deck that can dishonor your personalities uh, because that makes the attachment illegal. So you are running three copies of Ashigaru. Um, Shiryuken, uh, two force, uh, zero chi, one honor requirement, three gold in cost. Reaction if Shiryuken's personality is destroyed. Shiryuken becomes a personality aligned to your clan with a chi of one and a personal honor of one. All cards that were attached to the personality become attached to Shiryuken except um, illegal attachments. So normally when your guy dies, all the followers and items and spells that's attached to him die. What Shiryuken does is it steps in and says, um, I'm going to take over. Um, which was quite um, which was quite powerful 
um, for that for the back in those days. Three copies. And the last follower is Elite Pikeman. Uh, two force, zero chi, two honor requirement, three gold cost. Battle. Bow at the Elite Pikeman, destroy one opposing cavalry follower or cavalry personality without followers. Uh, so this was basically some cavalry hate, uh, otherwise, it was just two force. Um, the two honor requirement means there was only certain personalities you could put this on, uh, so be watchful of that. All right, this is an it, this is a card that many of you probably have never seen before. This is an ancestor. So an ancestor is a special type of follower, and or a special card type that acts and looks like a follower. Um, the important part is when a personality enters play, or when the, um, not when the personality, but when the ancestor enters play and attaches to personality, um, the personality has to bow to attach the sense, the, um, ancestor. So this is Shiryu no Tetsuya, uh, no force bonus, but has a plus one chi bonus. A two honor requirement and zero gold cost. Most ancestors were free. Uh, Brotherhood ancestor. This card counts as Tetsuya for uniqueness purposes. Um, all numerals on this personality are increased by one. So so anything in any of the boxes. So the force uh, uh, its forces increased by one, chi by one, honor requirement, gold cost, and any um, any printed bonus on the card of any sort. Now we get to the two items that you can search for in this deck. Armor of Earth, plus one force, plus two chi, eight gold cost. Unique armor. The gold cost of this card is zero if you have the Ring of Earth in play. So if you're playing against Unicorn and you started the Ring of Earth, you search up the Armor of Earth and you can play it for free. The Armor of Earth gains plus two force, plus one chi, while you have the Ring of Earth in play. So here again, for zero gold you get plus three force, plus three chi, and the following ability. Elemental reaction. Um, you may cancel and negate the effects of any action that would move this unit out of the battle it has been assigned to. I cannot send you home for any reason while this card is in play. Again, back in these days, um, you could use that reaction any number of times per turn. The card was super good in this deck. And other than Ring of the Void, this is the last card in the uh, Fate deck. Gunnison of Water, plus one force, plus two chi, nine gold cost, unique weapon. The gold cost of, the, of this card is zero if you have the Ring of Water in play. Gunnison gains, plus two force, plus one chi, while you have the Ring of Water in play. Elemental Battle, bow this card to move this unit into a, uh, into a province from the one it was in, or to and from your fief, which fief used to be the keyword for home. So you can move it home, move it, or move it to a battle, or from one province to another. And so basically, it's 
plus three, plus three, and zero gold if you have the ring of water in play. This is the other way you got around a number of these. Now, many of you may have looked at the oracle and noticed that they no longer say that they're free. They were errated in Diamond Edition where they were reprinted uh, for the um, um, House of Tau Dragon Edition um, to no longer reduce their gold cost to zero. But in this deck, didn't have that restriction. So if you're playing a Jade Arc event, enjoy your free weapons. This deck was a blast to play. I'd say it was probably my second favorite deck after Ford and the reason I was playing L5R. Alright guys, that's going to be the last of the Jade Era decks. I hope to be building both Diamond and Lotus in the, in the coming days and weeks. Um, as long as we can find enough of the uh, deck lists. So until next time, there is no escape from the tiger.